So I'm Ryan Luganbuehl. Um, so I'm a physician. Um, I got the entrepreneurial bug in medical school when I created some of the first medical podcasts. Um, fast forward to training. When I was training in surgery, I was the generation, the last generation of doctor to use the paper chart. And then the High Tech Act came out and made us all adopt electronic healthcare record systems. So on my off days, I started uh, helping with implementations of uh, Epic EHR. Um, fast forward a few years, I started working on um, population health platforms um, and basically workflow design for chronic care management. Since we had a value-based system or we're moving to a value-based system, I started working on those kind of platforms. And um, more recently, I've been helping out um, with Cornell University with their portfolio of healthcare IP through the Center for Technology Licensing. Thanks, Ryan. I'm Ian Hand. I'm the executive director of Venture Labs. We're a um, multi-sector technology accelerator located in Vancouver, BC in Canada. Uh, we're university linked, so we work with four of the research universities in British Columbia, and we also operate with other university accelerators across Canada, a network uh, where we uh, help the um, growth stage companies uh, with uh, opportunities like accessing the markets in China, and we work very closely with Beijing Hanhai in that regard. I have a background in life sciences as well, and uh, was also an entrepreneur and founder of uh, three venture-backed companies, and I ran a private uh, uh, equity fund as well. All right, thank you, Ryan and Ian. Uh, well, you can see a uh, Ian has both Ian and Ryan and has very close tie to the universities. And uh, here in the Bay Area, and uh, of course, we have excellent university as well. And uh, maybe not as good as Cornell, right? <laughs> well, the, uh, so of course, and uh, see, uh, a lot of universities uh, generated IPs and innovations uh, have progressed into products. and. Uh, helped a lot of companies grow into unicorns. And uh, I think the, uh, a lot of people in the uh, public opinion I believe Stanford is one of the best. MIT is also really good. Uh, I believe Cornell and uh, Summer Fraser is rather as well. But I think each university is different. So Adele was different, different university to tra uh, tech transfer offices uh, at Cornell. Uh, I help company to uh, do licensing deals with Stanford, with USC, with with UC system, and uh, so they're always each one is uh, different. And so uh, I uh, like to to know like uh, do you have any uh, lessons learned or any success stories when you uh, work with the uni university tech transfer offices? So one of the things that's fascinating right now is, you know, you look back a few years ago, all the great tech came out of garages, right? I would argue this generation of really big unicorns are actually coming out of, I think, universities, and particularly labs. Um, I, I say kind of a random number, but I think every lab has probably a dozen things you could commercialize. And a lot of times they don't know that. They have all these processes they're doing, all these things that they might put IP in, um, and a lot of times they don't know how to take it to the next stage. And that's becoming professionalized, because now some of these programs have seen what other great institutions have done with their tech and licensing offices, and they're starting to learn how to replicate that at multiple institutions. Um, and with over 100 medical schools in the U.S., there's lots of great ground right now for people that are developing amazing stuff based on NIH dollars that can be, you know, commercialized in the U.S., but also can be then translated to, to other countries with larger markets. So. Um, for tech and licensing offices, like I said, I think they're evolving right now and they're figuring out best practices um, really from each other. Yes, yeah, so um, I definitely agree that we're seeing a lot of innovation uh, based around deep science and, and more of the, the companies that are attracting resources, growing and scaling, are definitely uh, spinning out of the university labs. And this is um, uh, really a function of a number of things. One is the IP policies at universities. Uh, here in the U.S. with the Bay Dole Act, there are certain uh, requirements that the university offices and early stage companies or anyone licensing technologies needs to work through. In Canada, we have a different environment which also allows for independent commercialization 
and about 55% uh, of the universities have adopted this over the years. So uh, a creator at the university can, uh, 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 with normal reporting procedures, uh, just set up a company and uh, not go through a licensing process with the university. And this is very appealing for certain creators and certain uh, investors. However, um, most of the universities still provide a full set of support programs for licensing and for uh, the, uh, the creation of university spin-out companies. So we sort of have two styles of commercialization ha happening. And, and of course, this uh, for life science intensive companies uh, at the early stage for uh, independent companies, uh, rather than just licensing to a major pharma or uh, requiring a uh, you know a uh, option or development agreement from a major pharma is becoming feasible with flexible access to university labs with um, access to accelerators uh, sector focused uh, uh, mentorship that companies are um, uh, able to uh, access the resources they need, both government grants and assistance and angel funding and venture funding eventually, as well as later being in a stronger position to engage with large-scale large companies. Well, as the, uh, as the now we, U.S. and China, well, it's, I think a lot of people talk about this and uh, uh, U.S. and China right now in the trade war, and there's a lot of very sensitive topics. And well, as as you all know, uh, life science is very IP driven. Yeah, the IP can make company, IP can kill a company. And so in that, well, was in the tech transfer side, and for a small company just starting out of either university or all of the uh, the incubator, and try to make in very this very competitive. Uh, environment. So on the RP side, both on in the U.S. and also in all the cross-border collaborations or cross-border uh, operations. So uh, what's the uh, that that uh, I think the environment you think the uh, the the RP scene going to evolve given the uh, current situation, or you think it's just fat and will pass in three months, everybody everything back to normal. I'm sure hope so. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a crystal ball, um, but you know I think for um, a lot of these companies, they do have to have assurances that what they're making is protected in, and they can actually sell it in another country. Um, so to see that they do have protections is very important for, it, it's not a short-sighted thing, it's a long-sighted thing of continuing to commercialize in this country plus another one. So um, I, I do think uh, that's gonna be a force um, in the future if we want to have good therapies, good diagnostics, and so on, otherwise, the, the market really won't be able to bear um, very complex, um, expensive research in the future. So that's what I'd say about that. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, uh, the sort of price of protection is proportionate to the, uh, uh, the size of the market opportunity, the, the investment required to, to innovate that therapy, that product. So in certain, uh, certain segments, it's an absolute requirement to have protection. And uh, globally, if you're, if you're operating in a global uh, market context. But there's tons of opportunity for uh, companies in digital health and wellness and holistic medicine to innovate um, with lesser investment in IP and uh, relying on some of the uh, fast mover, uh, you know, uh, continuous improvement. Uh, type uh, methodologies. And there's a tremendous amount of opportunity in uh, the area of sort of untapping the value and potential in big data uh, in healthcare, both at a personal level and at a healthcare provider level. And we're just at the doorway of, um, uh, you know, like low cost data collection devices, uh, uh, sufficient security protocols, ability to share data sets on a uh, uh, anonymous secure basis to allow both for research and commercialization the development of solutions that will lower the cost of healthcare delivery. So companies that can uh, lead in that area and define solutions are, are, are going to make a lot of money and save the system a lot of money and improve patient care. Oh, those are all very great insights, and I think IP is also just one aspect of the uh, uh, make a life science company successful. Uh, I think the uh, we are 
a lot of people here and uh, are in like incubation and acceleration uh, space. I think it's a uh, uh, it's an innovation business, but it also is a, a service business. Uh, we provide services uh, to the startup companies and also to our corporate partners. And uh, of course, and as a service provider, and uh, we try to uh, uh, look at the pinpoints of our uh, clients or customers and uh, try to help them to uh, uh, overcome those pinpoints. But for any startup company, that's too many pinpoints. And so for us, like my, uh, I'm in this business, the question I always ask myself is how I can help those uh, companies grow? And what's the most crucial stage or most crucial points we need to address and help them to grow to the next step? Sure. So I think it depends on the type of product you're trying to sell. If you're selling a new therapy um, that just has you know, statistically significant, it is you know, best in class, that's pretty easy. Um, but then if you go more to the software services side, if you're creating a, uh, you know, a population health tool or something designed to work with doctors, that's about workflow. And that's really about doing good design that actually speeds doctors up and lets them give better care. Maybe there's better patient engagement tools. So I think in that sense, really kind of cultivating this idea of a design thinking process, getting in there and doing design sprints, working with your end customers um, during the customer discovery phase, that's important for that kind of product versus the one that's, this is a better therapy. So we know we have to sell this in the market. Yeah, the, uh, the sort of uh, ability to interact closely with clinicians and administrators to surface the problems and tune solutions is, is really key. Uh, but in terms of eliminating uh, pain points for um, early stage companies and roles that the accelerators and other innovation organizations can play, you know, there are many, you know, from basics like uh, uh, you know, you know, legal and accounting advice, uh, opportunities to uh, to prepare for raising different types of capital. These are all pretty standard, but within um, the later stage, growth stages, the uh, opportunities to uh, develop uh, business partnerships, business development support, uh, particularly on an international basis. So working with organizations like Beijing Hanhai uh, Investment Group and their uh, their affiliates, the Tsinghua Holdings Group and, and uh, uh, others within uh, uh, the PRC is really a huge advantage for North American companies to be able to um, identify um, uh, potential partners, uh, collaborators, investors, and to engage with them in a really efficient way, in a, in a supported way. So. Um, I think innovation hubs and accelerators that are helping with uh, you know, growth and scale up uh, in life sciences um, by working together with other organizations that have a similar industry uh, footprint and connectivity can really uh, uh, accelerate the results and, and deal with some of the issues we talked about earlier like intellectual property protection, you know, ethical behavior and contracting uh, issues which are not always straightforward. I agree with that. I think really to get access to, um, you know, if you're going to create a product, you want to get access to a hospital or to a lab, that's not easy for a, a startup to cold call and get access. So to be able to help with that is critical um, early on, definitely. Hi, uh, I know, uh, like, uh, also for uh, previous panelists uh, mentioned that uh, one challenge in U.S. in, uh, in relation to healthcare startups is the regulation or like it's hard to get a hold of patient data for a big data company or AI company. Uh, how's the things like in, in Canada, like if a US company, US startup or Chinese startup want to work with the, um, say hospital or in Canada, how would that work? I'd love to tell you that it's very easy, <laughs> but it's not actually, I would say um, in general, um, access to medical data in the U.S. is slightly more um, accessible under some of the new regulations. Canada is going through a lot of transformation at the moment, but has a, um, a, a National Privacy Act and Provincial uh, Privacy Acts that are currently inhibiting the executives of uh, regional, uh, what we call health authorities in Canada, 
of uh, providing more open access to data. Uh, that said, fortunately, there's a number of high-level initiatives led by uh, Canada Health Infoway and by uh, provincial governments, uh, that uh, Ministry of Health kind of level, that are uh, creating um, project opportunities of which, um, both medium and small companies, as well as some of the large uh, traditional solution providers, the Cerners and the IBMs that occupy uh, a lot of the, uh, provide a lot of the services uh, currently. And this is um, really important because it does, uh, uh, you know, open up this doorway of being able to innovate and create the, the meaningful solutions. Every, every hospital and health authority in Canada receives funding for quality improvement and is focusing on patient-centered care. So um, the ability to better utilize data which is being collected or can be collected as part of pilots and other studies uh, is, is um, I'd say, will be unfolding and benefiting the sector over the next uh, number of years. Well, Ryan, you got some answer for Canadian Healthcare system? Not for Canadian, but I think um, if you're looking at any country's um, solutions, right? A lot of people have great ideas, and they they say, "I can help this disease by creating this." But I think the most important thing to really realize, if you're going to survive as a, a digital health project, for instance, is try to embed it in government initiatives that are backed financially. So, like the High Tech Act, which gave rise to the EHRs. Now we have macro and quality payment program. This is pushing for basically money behind value-based care finally for Medicare. Um, more recently, there was the, the My Health eData initiative that was announced um, recently a few months ago, and Blue Button 2.0, where actually 53 million Medicare patients' data, they can actually get access to it and then shift it to someone else. That's huge. So those kind of initiatives, when you see those in any country, when policy changes and, and there's money behind it, that creates markets for digital health. So I have no relation to my eHealth. I'm a participant. I encourage everyone to go check it out. It's run out of UCSF cardiology. Um, but it's about data sharing. But anyways, um, to you, Dr. Uh, Luganbull. So your point about design sprints, I'm in shock. I've never heard a doctor use that terminology, and it's spot on. So I live inside a couple research hospitals here in the Bay Area. We're creating a system that can identify adverse outcomes throughout the hospital two to 40 hours in advance. And what it means, it's, it's going to change the entire discussion of how physiological data is interpreted and who does it, moving it from the nurse or clinician to AI. And I agree with the workflow point. So we start looking just like a typical workflow where we're presenting the, the physiological data at the nurse's station. So what type of dialogues would you suggest I start up because I'm welcome inside these institutions to begin discussions, but I would need them to, to work to get them to begin to think about completely changing how they look at some of their workflows like alarm fatigue. Thank you. Yeah, I would, um, a lot of times it's best to look for some sort of program um, that's embedded. Um, like at, at UCSF, there was a program that was a Steve Blank based um, customer development program, Lean Startup. And that was a good way to take an idea over 10 weeks and do that exact project inside UCSF, for instance. And that program was spread to a whole bunch of different institutions. So I would say look for those type of opportunities wherever they are, because then you can partner and speak to those people and start that dialogue and even get maybe the customer interviews you need to then get the user testing to run a design sprint. Those places like UCSF and Stanford, how do I encourage doctors to want to spend a few milliseconds at a time to how they would like to work on. Yeah, I, if you can, a lot of them are, what I found out about a lot of my doctor friends, they love software that they can work with that might help them. So if you can kind of brand it behind the idea of we're gonna sit down and you're gonna help me develop something, we're gonna develop this together, I think a lot of doctors are open to that to kind of run through maybe user testing if you, if you kind of position it correctly. So. You're shaking your head a lot, so I'd love to hear your comments as well. 
Well, great, great question, and um, I would agree uh, with everything. And just add that uh, you really need to find that one champion within um, the care unit, within the uh, 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 the organization that will um, help socialize the importance, the value of spending a little time on it, and be willing to do so themselves initially. Uh, so that, in our experience, you know, find, finding the uh, clinical champion, um, even for uh, the ideation process, review process, innovation challenge format, whatever you want to use. Uh, and there's so many good tools in organizations. There's uh, several groups um, focused on uh, quality improvement area that have a lot of uh, process information, helpful, uh, helpful tips, practical things you can use. So maybe um, I'd suggest reaching out to some of them and uh, seeing if they can help at all in catalyzing you know, local action. Well, I believe the uh, as any uh, company, big and small, and in life science, and the ultimate goal is to serve the patients. And uh, then, the, I think the a lot of big farmers and they have the ears of the patients, but not necessarily the right message to come across. As a small company, and how can you create a way to reach the patients? I think the I think social media is one way. But uh, I think like 23andMe and has really success, successful campaign uh, a number of years ago, and on social media already has a lot of uh, uh, I think it grow really fast from those social social media campaigns. Do you think it's a right way to go, or do you think there's the any other means and for small companies, or especially for companies with new technologies, to better educate the uh, the patients and then to really helps the patients and along the way helps the, the doctors, helps the, uh, the administrators. And uh, uh, I know it's the healthcare system is really complicated, but eventually how can we reach the patients? Sure, I would say get innovative. I like to look at what um, other tech companies are doing to, you know, a lot of companies, they're, they're resource strapped. Um, so I would take a little page out of the book out of these resource strap tech companies, which are, they're doing guerrilla marketing. I mean, they'll go to a conference and they'll create an event that looks like it's, you know, I didn't say this on camera, but they'll make it look like it's actually an event associated with that and they'll get people to come and that creates this, you know, guerrilla marketing campaign. Don't do that. Um, but you can do all sorts of creative um, campaigns um, to get access to, to, patients, do meetup groups, you know, whatever is appropriate for your use case. Um, but I think there's a lot of creative ways to do that. Yeah, def definitely uh, early stage companies need to be creative, uh, leverage um, any type of uh, earned media, guerrilla media that they can. Uh, but I think there's still an opportunity to be strategic within your channel. Uh, you know, part of it is educating government, uh, healthcare providers. Uh, uh, sometimes the costs uh, are not great, but the time and effort can be uh, more significant. But uh, company, small companies need to prioritize and, and really choose the activities that are going to have the highest uh, yield in terms of uh, building awareness um, and later when they're uh, approved for market trial and use of a product. Things get much more complicated at the market introduction stage, but uh, usually in the first few years they're, um, they're promoting uh, building brand awareness for the company and the solutions that they're developing. One startup um, I've been working with, they took an interesting approach for emergency management, for instance, and they would go to every single emergency management event in a city until they were really well known by the police department, FEMA, and so on. And eventually they got a interview, you know, and that was just free marketing. So I think that kind of thing can be done in healthcare as well. If you're going to the, the scientific meetings, the medical meetings, if you're getting to know the community, if you're pitching your idea, you're developing your idea, and you're getting feedback and buy-in from them. So that's definitely a great technique, yeah. I think the, uh, every few years, and uh, there's the, uh, the new trend that come and gone, and uh, we had an ARVR, and uh, I, at that time I thought every doctor would get like, a Google Glass uh, all the time. And uh, I do think it's uh, really good too for uh, surgeons and uh, for a lot of doctors. Uh, but uh, st still, and there is some difficulty both in regulatory and also uh, in the real applications. Uh, there's a lot of hurdles to, to overcome. And 
Well, as the now as the uh, the Fed is uh, blockchain and all those blockchain technologies and used in the uh, uh, in supply chain and uh, in coaching management and uh, in clinical trials. Uh, well, of course, it's not too late to catch the uh, catch the blockchain train. And uh, but uh, as the uh, entrepreneurs, as investors, uh, we always look at the next step. What was the next thing going to be? Of course, uh, I have a better right. I'll be a billionaire right now. Uh, but still, I want to look ahead, and uh, because the new technology is going to solve all the uh, the the, the meet the uh, meet the needs from meet the patients' need, meet the meet the uh, the customer needs. So let's look beyond blockchain, and uh, what do you think will be the next big thing? Oh, we're going to bet real money on this. So. Um, one of the things I, I really like right now is robotic-assisted surgery, um, particularly for, for specific use cases in orthopedics. Um, there's going to be a massive increase from, like, I think, 600,000 people getting knee replacements today to 3.5 million by 2030. Um, now, talk about China, we're probably talking much larger multiple of that. Um, so is robotic-assisted surgery, maybe even robot-performed surgery future, potentially? Um, and I think we're going to kind of find out what happens with that over the next few years, especially as we start to have shortages of doctors to perform all these different procedures. So always the uh, million dollar question you know what's the hottest sector what's next it's pretty hard to predict but uh, a lot of the things that are being talked about in all the sessions here are going to be at play if i had to be pressed to pick one which we are i would say uh, kind of the emergence of holistic uh, medicine which is going to be drawing upon a number of technologies so uh, certainly all the uh, uh, digital data collection uh, technologies but also involving uh, personalized medicine um, the uh, nutrition uh, aspects and really uh, leading to a greater overall understanding and ownership of one's uh, personal health as we move forward and family health. Um, I think we're also in that realm, but in more conventional medicine, we're going to see a big application of AI as well in uh, yeah, areas like diagnostics. All right. And say any other questions? Oh, if not, and uh, I see you two to give it the parting words. This is the last session of the day. Um, yeah, I, I would say I think the biggest thing is if anyone wants to innovate in healthcare, definitely reach out to the folks that are your users and and work on that design piece. Um, in the labs, of course, I would also do that. Even if you have the best therapy in the world, go figure out where it fits within the actual, you know, dispensing of that. How would a physician get the information, the genetic makeup of someone? How would they know what gene is relevant? What are they going to treat? What kind of regimen? How does it fit within workflow? And that's really the way to approach, I think, any innovation in healthcare. So I would say that, uh, like many things, innovation starts at home. It starts with you. So um, whether you're, you know, part, a clinician, you know, part of a clinical team, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're uh, leading a program, uh, supporting uh, innovation, uh, there's an opportunity to um, uh, think big, uh, try to find big, you know, meaningful solutions that matter to, uh, to uh, different stakeholders in your communities. Um, be ambitious about what you can do and put, uh, you know, put your energy into it and you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish. Like, you know, it's, sometimes we take for granted, you know, our progress year by year, but when we look back over five years, it's amazing what a, you know, a small company can accomplish. They, they go from ground zero to a hundred million and uh, lives saved. So that's really what it's all about. Yeah. Go for it. Well, I'm the uh, firm believer of a technology, and uh, especially techno not technology and life sciences. And I think in the last couple uh, panel discussions, say like whether you believe in precision medicine or not. And uh, well, I have to declare I'm a firm believer of that. And uh, I believe the. Uh, uh, the, with the uh, advance of technology, I uh, think the, uh, in the life science sector will get much much better, evolve much faster, get a lot more innovative. It's already a very innovative field, but I think the pace of the innovation uh, going to increase 
significantly we see an incorporation of a lot of new technologies. And well, uh, as a conclusion, and uh, thank you very much for all of you, and uh, stay indoors for the whole day, and uh, look at the uh, beautiful sunshine outside, and uh, thank you for coming, and well, next year, and uh, I think the, uh, we got to continue to do the life science session, and the four of the uh, Silicon Valley Entrepreneur Festival, and uh, it's going to be bigger, and uh, definitely going to be better, and uh, I'll look forward to 2019. Thank you very much.